Over the last nine weeks, we've been going through the 12 steps. Tonight, we're gonna be talking about the 10th step that says continue to take personal inventory and when we were wrong, promptly admit it. Patrick, what does that mean to you? Uh, It's really just about doing basic maintenance on a daily basis to keep myself from falling into my old behavior and uh, just just, uh, keep myself honest. That's good. Jason? Uh, For me, this is something I gotta do on a daily basis every day. It's to keep myself in check and honest with myself. That's good. John? Being accountable to my thoughts, feelings, and actions and realizing that my response is a reflection of where I'm at with God and every day I gotta get out of my own way because I can always improve. That's good. Debbie? Um, It's a lifelong process for me and I think it is for most people that we need to take inventory and realize when we're wrong because there's no way we can get to the final step, which is the goal of the 12 steps, and that is to help others that are still struggling. That's good. Darren? That's true. So, you know, for me, this 10 step um, is wholly dependent on my spiritual condition. If I am uh, soft in my spirit as willing, um, I'll know when I do something wrong. I know when I need to make an amend. And um, part of the way that I do that is I, I, I get to church, I go to a group, I get in a relationship, and I, I put myself out there and be vulnerable to help me to be in a better relationship so I can do these sort of things. The previous nine steps have really given me an examination, not if I'm going to be wrong, but when I'm wrong, and it's really freeing when you can admit it. So tonight we're going to go through the literature um, from AA and NA, and it's going to be awesome. We're talking about the steps. Say steps. Steps. So if you're taking a step, you're typically going up or down. You're never constantly staying the same. Either you're going towards freedom or you're going towards relapse. If you're complacent tonight without even knowing it in the unconscious, you're you're heading towards a relapse. If you're anything like me, um, when I relapsed, and I relapsed often, I never knew it was coming, um, but I had to learn that uh, they call it alcoholism. There's an ism that shows up before you drink the alcohol. They called me a dope fiend. So I quit the dope, but I was still a fiend. I was a fiend and I didn't understand. I thought the problem was dope and coke and crack and heroin, meth, uh, opiates, benzos, um, whatever my gig was back in the day. But, 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 but I was a fiend without the dope and, and, and it was surprising to me. So I had to do the steps and I had to realize that more or less the, the first step, this floor, as you've heard me say week after week, is, is where my addiction is. And, and I'm still paying the consequences um, of my addiction to this day. Some of our health related, some are financial related, um, and, and some are um, emotionally related. I mean, when you do as much drugs as I did, um, and you were a little boy, I, I mean, a grown man with little boy issues at the age of 35, um, I had to accept that and, and, and I had to mature and I had to, to learn. So, so I take the first step and, and I'm able to look at my addiction and all the consequences. But some of us at this, we don't do it perfectly. The AA says we got to do this as close as perfect as possible. So a lot of times I go back into my addiction and then I come to the first step and then I go back into my addiction. And I, and I never really get to the second step where I came to believe that a power greater than myself could restore me to sanity. I, I believe it now because I just listened to Nate and I heard about Scott and then I heard from Megan and, and, and then I heard the women, um, um, Liz and Sarah, talk about the strength of Megan and I heard from Gail and Penny and, and like, man, I don't think they're up there lying. I don't think they're up there um, um, just talking to talk because what I just saw, they spoke from the heart. It was authentic. It, it's not a show. It's not a masquerade. So that's how I came to believe that a power greater than myself could restore me to sanity. And, and then, then you guys, the we of the program, I didn't come here. You can't really say you believe in God when you get here because if you believed in God, you wouldn't be killing yourself. Maybe you went to church. Maybe you've read the Bible. Maybe you raise your hands in church. But I often question those, especially in spiritual programs, that say, oh yeah, I believe. I don't think so. Maybe you believe, but you don't believe in God. There's a big difference. So I get to the third step and I got to make a decision. Well, I'm not good at making decisions. My decisions never resulted in actions. So I needed you, as Scott said about his wife Penny, as Nate would say about Megan, is the fact that soon to be his wife, because I'm about ready to put the pressure on that one. <laughs> but, but I needed to be accountable to the decision I made. That's why people like Jim and Liz and 
myself create environments that will help us with be accountable. Because we're pretty crafty, we're pretty manipulative, um, um, we're, we're pretty devious and mischievous. So, so I, I need to tell you about the decision I made so you can hold me accountable to it. Because you know what, I, I, back in the day when I was younger, I'd, I'd have, you know, they, they'd teach me in treatment, you know, you can't go back to your old environment, you can't hang around, you're using friends, and some of you young people are struggling with that right now. You know what, I mean, you, 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 we can snowball those friends and tell them we can still drink or smoke weed or whatever. But when I got to the, the height of my addiction, there was no friends I was getting high with. And quite frankly, anybody that allows a, a dope fiend to relapse in front of you is not a friend. So I had to get a whole new group of friends, and that whole group of friends needed to help me hold myself accountable to the decision I made to turn my will and my life over to the care of God as I understood him. And then I would see guys like Nate that are of service. Um, that's your life. You're, you're active in service. That's like when Penny says, and his, when Scotty said, I mean, a real man, a real man, will, when you get hired early in recovery, will tell your employer that I need to be doing this. A real man will tell his girlfriend or his fiance or his wife is, I don't care what you say, and you say it obviously in a respectful manner, I'm here on Tuesdays. But if you're so afraid of offending people and, and, and looking for acceptance in all the wrong places, you won't set healthy boundaries of that. So I made that decision, but then, um, so if you look, as I said last week, the incline on these steps um, are not the same as the ladders behind me. And, and, and I have to remind myself um, now as I journey, which I would say a high percentage of people that are trying to recover never get to this journey. Quite frankly, I gave an assignment last night to an individual that's not even an addict to work a fourth step um, to look at their fears and resentments. But the fourth step, um, now I am making a searching and fearless moral inventory myself and I say it week after week, and I think people like me that are stubborn need to hear repetitive information. Um, because a lot of you who I love dearly, I ask you, do you know this step? Do you know it? And I'm trying to get this ingrained in you. I mean, if a dope fiend like me can remember these steps, anybody can. So I made a searching and fearless moral inventory myself. Um, I knew how to search because I searched for dope. But I never was able to search deep within my soul, as Jim Swanson taught us years ago, the why behind the what. The what is active addiction, but why? Why am I trying to kill myself? Why am I trying to do different things? So the why um, um, behind the what. So, so I got to search and, and I got to be, see, see, that's why I came at these tough guys. That the fact is, and tough girls, the fact is that I, you know, I ran the streets too. But I had to look, a lot of the, the egos and attitudes we see in people, are, it's really fear-driven. So I have to be fearless. Um, it, Scotty was fearless when he said he didn't have, he's not, he's not disrespecting his father. He's just saying his father wasn't a father to him. And that, that allows you guys to all relate. Because a lot of us didn't have that. But if Scotty can have 10 years without a good role model, and he got his role models here, any of us can do that. So I made a searching and fearless moral inventory myself. And you see now, I'm starting, the elevation of these ladders is higher than the, the earlier steps. And, and now, this is the second time that I had to admit. I admitted to God, to myself and another human being, the exact nature of my wrongs. Well, I learned about my wrongs. I'm like, I was resentful and justified or unjustified. I held on to that resentment and that was wrong. I have unrealistic fears um, the majority of my fears never played out, but they, they paralyzed me. So I had to admit that I had to show some other man that I'm just a little boy at these issues. I'm no longer trying to act tough. I'm no longer trying to pretend like I got it all together with everything I own has a hefty gut. I'm, I'm not going to be tough anymore. I'm going to put my walls down and I'm going to admit who I really am. And quite frankly, I don't like who I really am. And we all do not. We're all not liabilities. We all have assets. So, so I admit it. And then, and then I, I'm accumulating this information about myself. And then I get to the sixth step. And the sixth step he says I became entirely ready. I'm like, man, I don't like being resentful. I don't like walking around afraid. I, I don't like some of my conduct. And, and God gave me the strength down in step three 
that gives me the strength to make a searching and fearless moral inventory of myself. I've never admitted this stuff to anybody. And, and now I'm going to ask God because I'm entirely ready to have God remove my defects of character. My defects of character were caused because of my fears and my resentments. So now I get to the seventh step and, and I ask God, God, why do you have me having two ladders up here? You know, because sometimes in this elevation, um, you have to sit down for a minute. What are my character defects? What if I asked you what they were? What if I asked my sponsor or my spouse or my wife at the time or my employer, um, you know, help me out? I mean, and if they loved you enough, they would tell you. But, but here I am on the seventh step, and, and, and I, I've learned about humility and, and I humbly ask God to remove my shortcomings because I'm tired of coming up short. Here I am at 35 to 37 years of age, and I just keep coming up short. Because I am really ridiculously motivated or controlled or consumed by fear and resentment. And those fears and resentments are, are causing me... Um, to behave in such a manner, but I've been given the tools 11 treatments ago, but I still won't use them. So that's a shortcoming. Not using the tools that are available to me. Not calling my sponsor that doesn't have to help me. I don't have to teach you tonight. I didn't have to study. I didn't have to get as bold as I want. I didn't plan on doing that. When I opened my mouth, it just happened. I don't come here with an agenda but I'll allow God to use me in any way he can. So now I've got a pretty good look. Character defects, I talked to my sponsor, God already knew. I made that searching and fearless. I turned my life over to the care of God. I came to believe that a power greater than myself could restore me to me. I admitted I was powerless and my life had become unmanageable. Now I'm ready to go to a different playing field. Because a lot of this I haven't had to deal with anybody else but you. Which we can kind of relate, right? So when you come to me or I come to you and said, I just smoked crack, lost my company, and got divorced, I can relate. I don't know if that's a good or a bad thing. <laughs> but now I'm a little nervous because I, I, I'm okay. I've been looking at me, and now that was hard for me to do. But now I've got to cross the bridge into another element. And I have to make a list. And I'm looking out at all the people I have harmed. And in this step, I've got to become willing to make amends. I don't have to make the amends because the majority of the times I've worked the steps, I never did a step nine because in step eight, I was afraid to do a step nine. And I, was, I never made the list because I couldn't imagine myself actually making a direct amends. But now, I go up. And I make the direct amends. It's scary. And I talk to my sponsor. I'm, I'm scared up here. I don't like heights. But I'm looking at the world from a whole different perspective. And I'm ready to walk down these ladders to make amends and direct amends. Whoever my sponsor says, this is who you go to right away. This is who you wait for God to bring to you. And this is who you don't even talk to. But tonight we're on the 10th step. Look at how far away I am from my addiction. So now I got to look at all these things that can possibly creep up to me. Do I got to go make another amends? Because of my behavior today. Will I have to add to my list? Have I truly operated in my shortcomings? Have I came up short today? And did I promptly admit it? Where am I operating in my character defects today? Where did I lie? Where did I do this? Where did I... Uh, um, the fifth step taught me to admit it, so now I got to go to Steve Skoranek and say, Steve, I was in the zone. We had to get the house done. I didn't mean to talk to you that way. But thank you for helping me. 
And, and, and I have to look as I'm doing an inventory of myself. I got to say, where is fear and resentment? Because God removed them in seven and he cleaned my side of the street in nine. So when this stuff comes on me, not, not, not if. When fear tries to visit me, when anger is upon me, when shortcuts come on me, when manipulation wants to show up, when, 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 when I want to tell a little white lie, it don't feel right. It used to be just common flow for me. So I have to remind myself that I turned my will and my life over to the care of God. And he's the one who got me up there to begin with. And, and, and you know what? I mean, yes, God can do this. Uh, yes, I'm powerless. I've proven that uh, my life is unmanageable. And I do not want to go back here. But I'll never say I won't go back. You'll never say, hear me say I'll never get high again. I've said that until I'm blue in the face and I got high every single time. There is a side of me that wants to get high. There is a side of me, and, and God has lifted the desire like the big book said it would happen, and it happened, but the thoughts are still there. When the pressure gets too big and this, that, and the other, but I have to remind myself, it was a lot of work to get up there and stay up there. Because the air is a little thinner up there. And the steps are a little shorter, and I don't have a lot of room for air up there like I do down here. So I ask you tonight, before we dive into literature that we do not have a lot of time for, have you worked the steps? Because the reason why we don't work the steps is the same reason why I wouldn't dare with being afraid of heights to get all the way up top there. My knees were shaking. I'm used to doing bad. I'm not used to doing this. But I saw you do it. And if you can do it, I can do it. So show me how to do it. Show me how to continue. See, I never continue. I did it until I got my wife back. I did it until I got my money back. I did it until the judge was off my case. But I never continued to take personal inventory. And when I was wrong, promptly admit it. And that's why I had to do a fifth step. Because you know how long I've been living with these resentments? I don't want them anymore, so I have to do it promptly. I have to understand that if, 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 if I don't do it, they're going to do me. And, and now the, the AA says, as we work the, the first nine steps, we prepare ourselves for the adventure. Skronik says it all the time. I mean, if you're bored in recovery, you're not working a program. Every day is an adventure. It says, but when we approach step 10, we commence to put our AA way of living to practical use. It's a simple program for complicated people. Day by day, fair weather or fall, you really find out who a person is during the tough times. You know, when that pink cloud bursts, and you're not saying, praise God, hallelujah, I'm grateful to be here. This Tuesday night meeting is awesome. <laughs> and the day you don't want to come and you still come, that's when I know you're a man. You go to treatment and treatment's awesome. Treatment ain't supposed to be awesome. If it's awesome, you ain't working on yourself. But in foul, fair or foul, it says, then comes the acid test. Well, some of us think we're going to take LSD now. Can we stay sober? That's the first question. Keep in an emotional balance, second question, and live in good purpose. Where are you at in those three criteria? Are you sober only without keeping emotional balance? Are you only sober without living purpose? And, and that's the whole purpose of the 10 steps. And these are the rewards of if you truly work the, the, the 10 step. I got one of my friends in the front row by the name of Chuck. I watch him mentor men, and he, you know, not only in, in AA, but in, in life. And though these men are grateful, but, but I'm sure he, just like myself, over the years, have seen somebody turn ungrateful. Well, yesterday you were grateful. What happened? 
There's no emotional balance. And, and, and it, it, you know, I, 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 I can't relate to that. I, I'd go get high, but I never threw stones. But it says, it says, for the wise have always known that no one can make much of his life until self-searching becomes a regular habit, until he is able to admit and accept what he finds, and until he patiently and persistently tries to correct the wrong. The only thing that's wrong with being wrong is if you think you're right. And we didn't get, a, we didn't get to where we are today because we have a good track record of being right. It says... That is an emotional hangover, the direct result of yesterday and sometimes today's excesses of negative emotion, anger, fear, jealousy, and alike. If we would live serenely today and tomorrow, we certainly um, need to eliminate these hangovers. It requires an admission and a correction of errors now. Our inventory enables us to settle with the past. When this is done, we really are able to leave it behind. This is the third time in the 12 steps that you have to admit something. Step one, you admit you're powerless and your lives have become unmanageable. Step five, you admit to God, to another human being, and yourself the exact natures are wrong. And in this step, you should have a little bit of training to admit that you're wrong. And you have to do it now. It says there is a spot check inventory taken at any time of the day. Whenever we find ourselves tangled up, a lot of times we get so tangled up in our recovery and the only thing that's going to untangle us, and that's why I prayed for this for you, for you to go out there and hit rock bottom. If something was all tangled up and I slammed it on the concrete right now, it would untangle. And that's a lot of us, that's the only way we know how to untangle ourselves. We're emotionally tangled, we're mentally tangled, we're twisted, we're tied. And the only thing that's going to help up until now is we just go get high. And we hit rock bottom and we come back and we're full of consequences and we're overwhelmed because we couldn't deal with the consequences to begin with because we're twisted up. you got to tell you something, God's, God's got you, but the devil knows who's supposed to help you and he's going to try to get you away from those people. I mean, you got, again, intelligence. And it says, we got to admit our errors. Our inventory enables us to settle with the past. It says, there's a spot check. There's only one we take at day's end. I, I loved the retreat when I went through there because we always did a 10 step at the end of the day when we review the happenings of the hours just past. Then there are those occasions when alone in the company of our sponsor, our spiritual advisor, we make a careful review of our progress. When's the last time you asked somebody else in a spiritual authority over you how you're doing? I met with one of my spiritual daughters earlier. She was trying to get a question answered. I said, I don't think you, know, you want to know the answer to that. So many of us are addicted to the unknown, so we have the ability to fantasize the what if. It says it is a spirit, spiritual axiom. I don't know if I said that right. I don't care. That every time we are disturbed, no matter what the cause, there is something wrong with us. It's not. It, whenever you're disturbed, it's not about the other person. It has to do with you. Why are you letting them get to you? If someone hurts us and we are sore, we are in the wrong also. But there are no exceptions to this rule. What about justifiable anger? If someone cheats us, aren't we and I get cheated all the time. For us, AA, these are dangerous exceptions. We found that justified anger ought to be left to those better qualified to handle it. Let's just be honest with ourselves. I mean, few people have been victimized by resentments like we alcoholics have. It mattered little whether our resentments were justified or not. A burst of temper could spoil a day. A well-nursed grudge could make us ineffective, miserably ineffective. I mean, I've been there. I've gotten in a fight or mad at something. My whole day was consumed with that person. Yeah, I was at work, but I wasn't working. And, 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 and this literature is so true where I'm holding on to this stuff that's killing me. No different than the dope. And, and, and it says, nor were we skillful at separating justified and unjustified anger. As we saw it, our wrath was always justified. Anger, that occasionally lux occasional luxury of being more, more balanced people, could keep us on an emotional jag indefinitely. These emotional dry benders, the isms, often led straight to the bottle. Other kinds of disturbances, jealousy, envy, self-pity, hurt, pride, did the same thing. Our first objective will be the development of self-restraint. Oh, I'm telling you, if you can grab that, it'll save you a lot of time. So very, very few times do you see me get bold like I did at the beginning of the meeting, and I do it when it's needed. 
Because I can't get to everybody, so I needed, and, 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 and the thing is too, but a lot of times I restrain myself and just allow things to play themselves out. If you give a person enough room, be wiser than the game. Just give them enough room. I'm not going to say what the people normally say. Give them enough room and it will all work itself out. When we speak and act hastily and rashly, the ability to fair-minded and tolerant evaporates on the spot. One unkind tirade or willful snap of judgment can ruin a relation with another person for a whole day or maybe a whole year, maybe a whole life. Nothing pays off like restraint of tongue and pen. Some of us, I always tell anybody that is around me, don't text them back. Because once it's in writing, you're toast. <laughs> and these text wars that go back and forth, don't, I mean, common sense. Because once you get over it, they still got what you said in writing. Especially emails. I never, ever, ever do that. I mean, lot, I mean, check this out. We avoid quick-tempered criticism and furious power-driven. See, you got to understand, if somebody wants to argue with, them, with you, stop arguing. Then they will argue with themselves, but eventually they'll get tired. It takes two people to argue. So you don't need to argue with them. Let them argue with themselves. And, and, and here's the problem we run into. Too many of us are wasting our time fighting people. So when the devil finally shows up, we're tired. Chew on that one for a second. It says it will become more and more evident as we go forward that it's pointless to become angry or to get hurt by people who, like us, are suffering and growing up. So the people that I addressed at the beginning of the meeting are just suffering. See, when you stop hurting, you'll stop hurting. When you stop hurting yourself, you'll stop hurting people. N.A. works how and why. Self-examination, confronting what we find in ourselves and owning up to it. You have, in order to disown it, you have to own it. To our wrongs, the critical elements of conducting our lives with a spiritual basis. By working the 10th step, we become more aware of our emotions, our mental state, and spiritual condition. As we do, we find ourselves constantly rewarded with fresh insight. We always want to be aware of our emotions, our mental state, and our spiritual condition. The importance of keeping in touch with our thoughts, attitudes, and feelings, and behavior cannot be overemphasized. Every day, life presents new challenges. I, 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 instead of looking at them as challenges, I look at them as opportunities. Every day, life presents new challenges. Our recovery depends on our willingness to meet, not run from, those challenges. Our experience tells us that some members relapse even after long periods of clean time because they become complacent in recovery, allowing their resentments to build and refusing enough. Let me tell you about experience. I got 14 years of it. Thousands of people. We have experience and we know through experience what works and doesn't if you're off track, if you're not on track. Those who go to AA that have been there a long time have seen a lot of things in people like you and me. And they have experience. And they can see things that you can't see. It says little by little. It's not the big things. It's the little things. The small hurts, the half-truths, the just justified grudges turn into deep disappointments. Serious self-deceptions and full-blown resentments. We can't allow these threats to compromise our recovery. Some of us don't even know what threats are to our recovery. We have to deal with these situations such as soon as they arise. Each day we take our own inventory. Look at those when we fall short. You and I are always going to fall short of our spiritual ideals and renew our efforts to live a principle-centered life. We keep going forward, striving each moment to become even more aware of ourselves. We need to develop self-discipline. The more effort we put in doing so, the more we'll be fine in working the 10th step and become natural as breathing. This is as should be as important as breathing. Because if you don't do it, you might stop breathing. You might stop breathing through a relapse or an overdose. If our friends notice that we're acting in a character defect, truly your friends, not your homies, that co-sign it, oh, this place sucks. I know it sucks. Doug sucks. Who does that guy think he is telling me? Who is he talking to me? At the beginning of the meeting, I'm bigger than he is. So come out of here. Where are you going? How many options you got? God will give you, he'll eliminate the options. It's called a prison cell. 
And, and pastor can teach you that. That's where he found God. And, and God will do whatever it takes because he loves you that much. Um, I'm just too, I, the reason why I'm not as involved as I once was is I'm just too darn nice. I just love too much. And I, I, you know, it's not that people can con me. It's just that I just want to give everybody the benefit of the doubt. But, but it go, I mean, I was just down at uh, Life Rebuilders. You should see how that guy runs that sober house. I loved it. I loved what he was saying. And those guys received it. See, in order to be a man, y- you have to be able to re- be, talk man to man. And, and, and that's what I love about people that, that have been through the military. If you've been through the military, stand up. Let's give these people a hand. Thank you for your service. Thank you for your service. And it, it talks about here, um, our friends notice, being open-minded suggestions of our sponsor and NA friends. Be careful who you talk to. Paying attention to what our conscience is telling us, spending quiet time with God of our understanding, all these things lead to greater clarity. Many of us have remarked on the freedom we experience by freely admit. You know, it's, it's, it's freeing to say, you know what, I was wrong. I was wrong for saying that. I was wrong for doing that. Of the mistakes releasing ourselves from unrealistic unrealistic expectations where before we went on one extreme to the other either feeling better than everyone else or feeling worthless we now find the middle ground of true self-worth can flourish as the inner chaos i was addicted to chaos that lived within us for so long subsides we begin to experience long periods of serenity i didn't like long periods of serenity so i had to go wreck something During these times, we experience the powerful presence of a loving God in our lives. We are increasingly conscious that a power that we are to search for ways to maintain and improve our contact with it. Seeking direction. If you're going to seek direction, you also have to welcome correction. It says, meaning of our lives. We go on to the 11th step, NA basic text. One of the first things we learn in Narcotics Anonymous is that if we use, we lose. I used to go to an NA meeting off of Franklin in Chicago, and this guy met me at the door every week. He says, just don't use, just don't use, just don't use, just don't use. And that was my starting point. But if I just stopped using, I still didn't have any emotional balance, and I didn't find my purpose. You know, first, I, I, I'm not going to do anything without, without stopping using. But by the same token, we won't experience as much pain as we avoid the things that cause pain. Continue to take personal inventory means that we form a habit of looking at ourselves, our actions, attitudes, and relationships on a regular basis. We are creatures of habit and are vulnerable to our own ways of thinking and reacting. At times it seems easier to continue the old rut of self-destruction than to attempt the new and seemingly dangerous. Why is this dangerous? It, it's kind of dangerous up there. Why, why do I think that recovery is more dangerous than dope dealing? or violence, or driving drunk, or leaving my family. It makes no sense. We don't have to be trapped by our old patterns. Today we have a choice. Each and every one of us have a choice tonight. This step can be a defense against old insanity. We can ask ourselves if we're being drawn into old patterns of anger, resentment, or fear. Do we feel trapped? Are we setting ourselves up for trouble? Are we too hungry, angry, lonely, and tired? Are we taking ourselves too seriously? We examine our actions, reactions, and motives. We find out what we've been doing better. And we see there's a, there's a difference between feeling and doing. You can feel like crap and still do good. And it goes on to say, this allows us to examine the action, admit fault before things get worse. We need to avoid rationalizing. We promptly admit our faults, not explain. Quit, less is more. When I, when I coach somebody, uh, I was at SA at about one in the morning, this guy who's in a lot of trouble with the law, and I don't really know him that well. He says, hey coach, what word do you got for me? And I think to myself um, of that, that so many of us need a coach, but... A lot of us, when you make a 10 step, just, just own it. Don't explain. Well, I really did it because I woke up with a headache and then I had a bad attitude and then I thought I packed a bologna lunch and I didn't pack any lunch. And that's why I called you a you know what. You don't have to explain it. You know, so it, it says admit it, but not explain it. 
We, if you had the life I had, you'd feel like, I mean, we just go on and on and on. We need this step even with feeling good. I mean, sometimes we, we all the time have to make a 10 step when we're doing good too. Good feelings are new to us. Yeah. And we need to nurture them. I'm, I'm used to feeling bad. I'm used to having regrets. In, in times of trouble, we can try the things that work during the good times. We have the right to feel good. We need to remember that everyone makes mistakes. But just because you and I are made a mistake, even the guys that I have to address, I still love you. I still want to work with you. And, and, and the thing is, is how, see, the problem is we're so used to people leaving us and we treat them so poorly that we force them to walk away. Or we walk away before they walk away. And that's a character defect. And, and it says, by continuing a personal inventory, we are set free from, in the here and now from ourselves and from the past. We no longer justify our existence. This step allows us to be ourselves. I don't know if you made that on that PowerPoint, did you? Did you not? Okay. So I, I wanted to show you something. I was down at uh, that rest, uh, ice cream joint. Um, I forget the name of it. Down, down off Hennepin, and there was something in the Urban Dictionary that said the definition of Jeffin. Do you have it? I want you to read it. But more or less what it says is kissing you know what when you have ill feelings towards the person. If you live your life Jeffin, <laughs> and you have to greet and smile at people that you despise, you really just despise yourself. Because God will free you in a way where you don't have to carry. So as I close, and I apologize for going longer, but this isn't about you or I. It's about the people that this information will get to. It says, are you drifting or on solid ground? The Bible says to test yourselves out to make sure you're solid in the faith. In recovery, you have to be solid. This stuff is life or death. It says don't drift along taking everything for granted. If you're drifting along, you're drifting towards the dope house without even knowing it. Give yourselves regular checkups. You need first-hand evidence, not merely hearsay that Jesus Christ is in you. Test it out. If you fail the test, do something about it. Some of you are failing the test right now. Some of you are failing the test. That does not mean you're a failure. It just means you're failing the test. And if you do not do something about it today, you may not have a tomorrow. God bless you.